Um, I brought um, no handlers with me, so Lord only knows what I might say. Usually there's someone in the crowd that gives me that look of, don't go there. Um, I also decided, um, I have some prepared remarks, um, but I decided uh, perhaps just to speak to you as a human being. And um, after sitting and listening um, this morning, a few things I realized as a prosecutor and an elected prosecutor of a city um, is that maybe we don't all share the same language. Um, so there were some moments today um, throughout this conference where I thought, I have an idea of what they're talking about, but not completely. Like when my daughter would come home from French class, I kind of had an idea, but um, should have paid more attention myself in that class in order to help her. So um, one of the first things I would say is that we, we probably need um, to build better collaborations uh, than we currently have so that we can better work together. Um, I think that's just a necessary step. So one of the things that I've done in my jurisdiction um, is I've taken um, in the prosecution world some pretty big risk. I've created a reentry program, um, which to prosecutors, um, the response I received you know, from my staff was, wait a minute, you're gonna bring guys that we sent off to prison, you're gonna bring them back and we're gonna work with them again. Um, when we really have no jurisdiction to work with them. And I said, yes, we are. I am going to do that. Um, and I'm going to do that because the recidivism rate is hurting our community. It shows um, we have failed in some way when a minimum of 40% um, are, are recommitting new crimes in the community. One of the ways I did this program um, seemed like a big risk uh, to others, but to me it just made common sense, and that was to hire someone that had spent a considerable amount of time in the penitentiary system in my state, because he knew how to work with this population uh, much better than I did. And so I picked um, an individual with, um, in this case he had some pretty serious um, felony convictions, that did not go over so well within the office. But it was the right thing to do. And um, you know, with time and um, through our collective experiences, I think we uh, now would all say it was a good decision because uh, he is certainly producing a good result for us. So he has now worked with me uh, for about four years. And the idea um, is that he goes to uh, prisons and visits with individuals as they are slated for release. We usually start about eight months out and he continues to make contact with individuals who um, are slated for release. They don't get an early release um, to be in this program, but they do, um, they have designated Kansas City as the place that they wanna come back um, home. And so we are going to have them back in our community, whether we want them or not, they're coming. And so we may as well try and offer um, some services to them in order to get them to live in our community successfully. So that's really the bottom line. Uh, so this individual um, makes that initial contact for the office and continues that contact. He is, um, the title we have given him is client advocate because uh, it seemed um, like the right idea. Uh, that's what he is. And I learned a great deal over the past several years as to what this program can do, what it cannot do. Um, and then I also um, created a program on the front end um, for those first time felons. Uh, those, those are generally young folks who are coming into my system for the first time. And as we have all spoken about uh, this morning, that felony label um, is quite a showstopper for them. It is something that will Im impact them for the remainder of their life. Um, when I first started in this business about 20 years ago, believe it or not, it, um, a felony conviction wasn't that devastating. It really wasn't. Um, it, it just wasn't. It is today. Today it is a ban to even putting in an application for a job. So it, um, we must look at it differently. We must look at it, uh, that felony conviction label, um, for what it actually does to people for the next 20 and 30 or, and even more years of their life. 
And so um, for this group of individuals, um, I put together a program called New Start. And it was just an opportunity um, for them to walk through a more rigorous diversion program, and then we'd wipe away um, that felony. It would, it would um, go away from their record. Um, this program I was most excited about. Um, and likewise, other prosecutors in the office were excited about this program. We didn't have a clue um, about the population that we were trying to serve and how very difficult um, they were uh, to receiving services. And all I can tell you after years now of performing this program, the biggest piece that has helped me um, find success for these uh, mostly young men, some young women, has been a mentor. So we have teamed them with mentors from the community. We have mentors that go through a little mentor training program before they can qualify to serve as a mentor. And um, basically, it's, it's dads. <laughs> basically, we're looking for a substitute dad. Uh, that's basically it. It's basically it. Um, we provide a lot of services. We provide a lot of assistance. Um, and you know you have to have a little bit of a forgiving nature, um, especially for young folks, um, because they are going to make uh, some mistakes along the way in your program. So you can't have a zero tolerance policy, but you must uh, sort of glean um, what mistakes they made, why did they make them, and um, are they amenable uh, to completing the program. So um, these are some basic ideas the problem that I um, encounter, however, is that all of this programming comes out of my prosecutor budget. And um, that means I have fewer prosecutors to do the job of prosecution, which is what we are there to do. So I don't have a budget for diversion. We just have to kind of make it up and create it. And the other thing I want to tell you is that we're not experts at diversion. We're not experts in the area of mental health and substance abuse. And so we continue to find folks to work with us, uh, to pair with us, but that's not, that comes at a cost. Um, there's a fee for that. And so uh, we've had to dig deep to try and find partnerships um, and partnerships that we could afford uh, to continue these kinds of programs. So very, I think the unfortunate part of this is that they are small in scope. When my office prosecutes uh, six to 7,000 felonies per year, um, and I'm talking about in my reentry uh, court having about 30 individuals per year, and in my uh, new start, that's the first time felon uh, program to divert you away from your felony, um, is only about 25. So then, you know, these numbers don't, they don't, uh, they don't compute. So we're gonna need to do something differently. And the only thing uh, I know to do differently is to remove some of the barriers between people like me and folks like you and to put us together uh, on that front end. So when that prosecutor is making a filing decision, should I file this case? Do I have enough evidence to file this case? And what should my offer be when I do file the case? Um, I need other professionals to be there to help us at, the, at that moment in time, not later. But in that moment in time, help us figure out um, if, what are the risks of this individual? Do we have, can we have an assessment of this individual? And can we have a plan, a plan in place as to where this individual could go so that out of the gate we could divert them uh, to a more proper treatment kind of program? The only way I know to do that, the only way any of us have ever done anything well is uh, through our collective partnerships. Um, so if I'm promoting anything today, it is uh, to continue that dialogue and that, that quick, um, at that moment, uh, that crime has happened, uh, that hopefully we're before that. You guys are working before that. But the moment that crime happens in a community, at that point, you are working alongside a prosecutor to help us determine what's the right path for this individual, where should they go, what's appropriate. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, there's one thing one uh, critical piece of the system that was not mentioned not once uh, yet today, at one time, and that's victims. Victims matter. Victims matter. Victims are critical to this process. They need to be included in a process um, 
for this holistic system to actually work. So victims uh, must have some role in this entire process in order for a restorative justice model to actually work. Thank you very much.